Welcome to the Energy News Beat Podcast. My name is Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group. We've got some crazy things going on in the world today. And when we sit back and we take a look at an LNG ban, you take a look at postpone, postponement, but you take a look at the world as it needs low-cost energy. And what does the U.S. need? It needs energy security. We need to be able to export our LNG to our other allies around the world. But yet today we have an expert in the global um, export. He is the Gulf Coast Regional Director at API. And I mean, Gifford Briggs, welcome to the podcast this morning. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Hey, I'll tell you what, we were sitting here chit-chatting right before the show. And you've got some wolves in a drawing back behind you. Those are some pretty cool drawings. I appreciate it very much. Yeah, something that um, was a gift from my father. And uh, it's a nice remembrance of him every time I come into the office. Oh, isn't that great? I'll tell you, I am a big fan of artistry. artistry, And uh, it's a good thing that we don't have any activists trying to uh, throw things at those, right? If they're a gift from your father having a uh, activist in your office would not be very fun, would it? Uh, no, fortunately, nor, nor would having live wolves be very fun in the office. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll just be glad that we get to keep them up on the wall for the time being. We just solved the world's problems right now. <laughs> Feed all the activists to the wolves. I think we just solved this problem. Okay, film at 11. I'll tell you what, though, Gifford, Tell me what you have going on at the API. You've been there for a few years and you really, I really want to know what you guys do. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, that's a loaded question because we do a lot, but um, <laughs> API is a, uh, is an organization that's been in place for over a hundred years. We actually started out as a standards organization. Um, we maintain a catalog right now of, of over 700, 800 uh, different standards that are used across uh, across the globe. Um, and and so, you know, for instance, if you go to get oil change, when you buy the oil, you'll look at it and you'll see that it is an API certified oil, meaning that it has been manufactured nice. according to API standards. Um, we do standards for, you know, obviously for things like that, we do them for, you know, pipeline specifications, how to test pipelines. We do a lot for blowout preventers, and then stuff you would see in, in the refinery. So again, a large catalog of standards. So that's right. one part of what we do. Um, teach the standards, certify, uh, you know, industry equipment and whatnot. And then the other part of what we do uh, is more the traditional trade association work that people are familiar with and that we uh, represent the natural gas and oil industry across the country, um, our headquarters in D.C. So we do a lot um, in, in Washington, D.C. and the federal government. But we also have a regional state governmental affairs program, which is what I'm a part of, uh, with eight offices across the country. And so for my office in the Gulf Coast region, uh, we cover the best states, of course, uh, in Arkansas, Louisiana, (laughs) Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. Um, And uh, I'm from Louisiana, but we're headquartered in uh, Tallahassee in the great state of Florida. So uh, I love love what I get to do. Obviously, I I have great states to, uh, to represent and to work with. Um, as we advance, uh, you know, good, smart energy policy across the Gulf Coast. But you know what's way cool, Gifford, is the fact that the API's impact on the environment is huge. And when you take a look at uh, Iran, Iraq, uh, Venezuela, and then American producers, we actually do it pretty darn good with it taking care of the environment, thanks to folks like you that are making sure the rules actually mean something. Well, look, our our industry has been uh, advancing technologies to produce uh, American natural gas and oil in uh, the most environmentally responsive and and, and safe way possible, both for the environment and for employees, the communities that we that we work with. And that's something we're very proud of. Um, And we've certainly over time been able to export that technology um, around the globe. Obviously, a lot of API's members are international and global companies. And, you know, they take the, 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 
what they've learned here in the United States. And when they go produce in other countries, uh, they don't leave that at the state's border. They take that technology and they become the cleanest producers wherever wherever they go. And something obviously is an industry we're very proud of. Um, there are others that want to knock us, uh, you know, any chance they get. But I'm very proud of the industry that, that I get to be a part of and, and the fact that I've been able to represent them now and in, in various capacities for uh, nearly 16, 17 years is, 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 a, is a blessing. You know, uh, and as you sit back and you, you take a look at, at uh, what we've got going on, I'm looking at a, a map from the Global Energy Monitor, and we've got, uh, you look at, you've got the, the region right there, New Orleans, Houston, San Antonio, and you've got all of these pipelines going out into the Gulf. And I mean, we've got just on this ballpark, uh, 361 uh, LNG export, LN, uh, LNG terminal import, 441 and uh, 2,862 uh, pipelines in the U.S. <laughs> well, you know, when, when, wow. when I was with the Louisiana Oil and Gas Association before, we loved showing a map when we were giving presentations of the pipeline infrastructure, and uh, it always looks like a heart, right? With the aorta coming right through Louisiana, um, <laughs> you know, fifty percent of the of the fuel it's it's refined and powers our nation's you know vehicle and transportation infrastructure comes right through Louisiana, and you know. Uh, Louisiana doesn't always get the recognition it deserves, but it is quintessential um, to the, you know, not only the, the nation's energy makeup, but really the global energy makeup and, and uh, plays such an important role. Oh, and when you take a look at Port Arthur uh, and then you take a look at the other one right next to it in there, holy smokes, Batman. I mean, that we would be dead meat without Louisiana, without Texas. It just would not be the same life. Uh, that is true. We provide uh, quite a bit of, of economic security and freedom comes right through those uh, couple hundred miles of coastline in, in Louisiana and Texas. Absolutely. Now, now we just had this Biden uh, pause, if you would. Could you go, lead us through what happened and what the API's opinion is on that? Because I got my opinions, but yeah. my opinions. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, you know, essentially uh, the administration announced the decision to pause uh, any new uh, LNG export permits. Uh, the, so the constructions of new LNG facilities to export um, uh, natural gas LNG uh, to non-free trade agreement countries. So essentially, you know, Europe and all of our allies and everywhere else. Um, and, you know, there's different companies that are in different stages. It doesn't, it doesn't pause the existing facilities, but the, but, but even the existing facilities that were looking to expand, which were quite a lot, had permits to add additional export capacity to their existing facilities. All of that has been stopped or paused or, and I think, uh, how how permanent or indefinite it is. Uh, there's probably, you know, um, a lot to be said later on this year with some of the elections of, 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 of right. what may or may not look like. Um, while they, you know, while we're, we're in silly season, right? It's election season, right? So it's always silly season. And, and um, you know, it's unfortunate because uh, as, as we talked about earlier, I mean, American natural gas is the cleanest, you know, produced natural gas in the world. Our allies, particularly those in Europe, are in a situation where Russia has shut them down. They've literally just turned off the valves to provide all right. the fuel to our allies. Um, and in the wake of that, the president, which is kind of ironic, committed that we would supply all of the fuel and energy um, that they need. And while we I are doing that to the best of our ability right now, um, you know, demand for energy continues to grow. And if we don't take American expertise in clean burning natural gas and, right. and provide that to countries um, around the world, um, they're not just going to not have power. They are going to do seek other options. And the most likely other option immediately is either get the same natural gas from somewhere else where it won't be as produced nearly as cleanly or environmentally friendly as we do here in the United States, right. or we're going to switch to coal, which I think we all know by now that coal is not nearly as clean of a producer of energy 
as natural gas is. So while saying, while the president is saying that he wants to, that he's pausing LNG permits uh, for to 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 make sure that's the right thing for the environment, it is very clear and easy to see that it is the right thing for the environment because the other options that countries have besides American natural gas. All, all are more impactful in a negative way to the environment than than what we could provide here in the United States. Sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> oh no, I th I think it's fabulous when we sit back and, and and take a look at um the political negative connotation of what's going on with this halt is because the great U.S. companies are going to. Uh, be set back because the I've never seen these long term contracts, 25, 30 year contracts. Cutter is just going nuts. Uh, how do you pronounce it? Cutter, Qatar, Qatar. I, I, I'm from Oklahoma, Texas. I'm half breed. So it's kind of like I, I think you're hey. doing great. So I'm not even going to say that. I'm gonna say I think you're doing great. <laughs> but, you know, we, we sit back and go. The Biden administration does not realize what they're doing by placating to the extremists and placating to his base. He's hampering long term investment. He's hampering long term commitments to our allies. I almost wouldn't want to be an ally of the U.S. now. Yeah, I mean, that's that certainly falls outside of the uh, uh, of the APIs. Uh, it, it does. Uh, but look, look there. So I don't want to speak too, too, too difficult there. But, you know, certainly we made a commitment and, you know, pausing the construction yep. of additional LNG facilities um, doesn't look like. And again, our we're, we're shipping the LNG that they need now. But that doesn't mean that that we're going to be able to rise to meet their demands in the future. And so we've seen it where they've had to look you know, start looking towards coal and yes, you know, if they can't get LNG in the future from us. Um, they're going to want to get it from somewhere else. And does that mean that they turn back to Russia? Does that mean that they turn to China? And that's not exactly positioning ourselves, our yeah. own national security, um, not even looking at the environmental situation. It doesn't put us where we, where we could be um, in, in, in being able to supply the world's energy. You know, Gifford, you just kind of nailed a big point. I had an epiphany while you were talking on this, and that is the activists, the global um, or the excuse me, the um, uh, anti fossil fuel activists that Biden was listening to. And it, it turned out that it was Bloomberg had put in there that it was there was articles that were out there saying Bloomberg and all these others influenced Biden to put the pause on there. That pause is actually doing more harm to the environment than actually letting the LNG go forward. And it's actually kind of stupid that they're doing more harm to the environment by putting these pauses in. Well, and, 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 and you're 100 percent right. And we've seen this, um, you know, in some different varying degrees throughout the, this administration when we look at their energy policy. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're shutting down the leases in the Gulf of Mexico where 2024 will be the first time in, in since the beginning of the offshore leasing program that we won't have any oil and gas leases in the Gulf of Mexico. In the five year plan that they put out there, we only have, uh, I think, three lease sales scheduled when we're used to having, you know, on average, at least two a year. Um, and, and throughout this four year period of three year period of time, this administration, whenever we were Whenever the, we look to, wow. to see have high energy prices, instead of turning to American energy and saying, can't, what do we need to do to produce more energy here locally? They begin looking and saying, OK, can OPEC, can you increase production? Right. Because shutting down American production doesn't change energy demands globally. In fact, if you look at the EIA. <laughs> You're only seeing there we're adding more people. The global energy demand is going up. And on top of that, the demand for natural gas and the demand for oil, no matter how much effort is being put into bringing on renewables, which look, we're for renewables. We're for all of the above energy. You bet. No matter how much we're seeing that grow, the demand for natural gas and oil continues to increase into the future. And so 
we know we do it the best here. We know we do it in the most environmentally responsible and safe manner. Yep. Uh, in the Gulf of Mexico or in the Haynesville Shale in Shreveport, Louisiana, all the way up into North Dakota, South Dakota, Pennsylvania, Texas, we do it the best. We do it better than any other countries do. We do it safer. We do it more environmentally responsible. Why not harness all of that great energy that's produced yep. here, put Americans to work, generate revenue and wealth for for our country and then export that success abroad you know i i find it funny um and i just signed the uh, thing uh, in december the uh oil and gas executives for nuclear and i i have never met anybody in the oil and gas space that doesn't like they, they say we don't care we're we're here to deliver low cost energy if it's wind, solar, nuclear, we don't care. But if you're on the other side, it's like all of a sudden you're hated because you are delivering natural gas. And I think it's great that in 20, I think, it, uh, Gifford, you have to correct me if I'm wrong, but it was uh, 2022, the EIA said the biggest reason that we lowered our emissions was because of natural gas. The well, hundred percent. The conversion to natural gas from from coal power plants has led to the greatest re reduction of of emissions th anywhere, and we're you know, and we're continuing to see that trend today, where emissions continue to get lower. And now industry is investing you know uh, billions of dollars into uh, capturing carbon emissions from you know refineries and everywhere else, and then and, and injecting that safely, storing it safely underground away from water away from anything right. could impact the the environment uh which a few years ago uh was something that the 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 many many that were, were saying calling on the industry to do and saying that it's just the industry doesn't want to spend their money uh doing this now we're doing it and they are attacking carbon capture and storage um like it was you know like it was producing oil and natural gas and it's just Every we continue to look for ways to do things better. We continue to do it better right. and provide the energy that the world needs. Um, and we're going to continue to do it. We're going to continue to rise to that challenge. It's great that we see a growth in wind. It's great yep. that we see a growth uh, in solar. We've got companies that are investing in Arkansas in lithium extraction technology. Isn't that great? Be able to to help provide the the resources that we need to build out our electric grid. And so our our industry is investing in all of these spaces to make sure that we can meet the energy demands of the world, not just today, but yep. into the future. Um, and we're going to continue to do that. And and we know that the world needs us. We know that the world needs energy. Um, yep. And it's only going to need more because so much of the world right now doesn't have access to energy. Period. They don't have yep. access to reliable electricity period. And so, you know, they would love the idea just to be able to have, you know, reliable power at their home and electricity at their home. Um, and so we're going to continue to work so that as those people have the lights turned on, uh, we have the energy that they need to do it. Isn't that great? Uh, I just did a uh, podcast with Doomberg and Chris Wright from uh, uh, Liberty. And uh, I love love those guys and we talked about energy poverty and it just absolutely that is one of my hot buttons why we take it for granted we it, we take it for granted in this country because every when you go home and you go flip that light switch on you know there's going to be power now some people might think that the power comes because they trapped it in the drywall but it doesn't matter regardless <laughs> of where you go when, it, when you go to flip on that light switch, <laughs> right? you go flip on that light switch, you know there's going to be power. And that is yep. just not true for a large percentage of the world. Um, no. And so, you know, they, they're, a, as we meet their demands, as we, as we get to the point where we can provide them power and electricity and build out their grids and do that, and, and there are people all over the world that are trying to make that happen for communities, you know, all everywhere. They're going to need more energy. Um, yep. They're going to need to go through their industrial revolution and they're going to want to have vehicles and they're going to want to have cars. And and so there's going to be a tremendous demand for energy. Um, yep. And if we we if we stop making investments today, that's yep. not going to stop their demand for energy in the future. It's just going to change where they get it from. And again, the world is much better off. Yep. If they're getting that energy from the U.S. than if they're getting that energy from China and from Russia and other places, especially those that are hostile to the U.S.
Oh, yeah, Gifford, you're singing my song over here. I was visiting with NJ uh, Anuk from uh, the African Energy Chamber uh, with Cyrus Brooks uh, with our uh, ABC. And uh, that was a great conversation about that very same thing is that a Africa needs to uh, use their own natural resources. Let's import the u.s technology that you described uh, let's let them do that and not force them to go to the high priced renewables uh, that technology cannot support and let's get them jobs let's get them uh low cost energy let's take the apis um really good um uh knowledge base and export that to africa a hundred percent and you know imagine um you know if you can if you can go to africa and imagine all of a sudden they've got power at homes and and the, and just you know what that would how that would transform you know a city or a country and really the whole continent i mean it's you know that is only a good thing for the united states right yep. and it's only a good thing for humanity Absolutely. And, and I'll tell you, um, what do you see uh, coming around the corner for the API? Because I, I always get tickled when I see uh, somebody, some uh, talking head on the news or something, uh, and they go, hey, something in oil, quick, let's get somebody, you know, uh, quick, what's the number to 911? Or give me the number of the API. The API says this or that. What do you think is coming around the corner right now? Well, I mean, I don't know that we have to look too far to see what's around the corner. I mean, I guess the big question is going to be is, you know, this year's elections, energy is on the ballot. And, you know, I think yep. people, you know, once again, going to have a choice. I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of people that are really surprised by some of the action that President uh, Biden and this administration have taken. Um, I haven't, you know, really been that surprised because, you know, the actions he's taken were very consistent with what he said on the campaign trail. Right. Um, and I think again, this year, you're going to see a very, um, you know, uh, you're going to have a choice between two approaches to energy. Um, one um, that wants to harness American uh, ingenuity and to uh, provide economic and, and, and national security uh, through energy dominance um, yep. and, and producing and harnessing the, 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 the technology and, and, and industry here in the United States. You know, and one that wants to, you know, very aggressively force a transition away from natural gas and oil um, into other technologies at a pace that's it's really not sustainable. And, um, you know, you can see it in the policies, whether it's the LNG pause or the leasing uh, approach, um, you know, or through some of the other policies, you know, where they're mandating the purchase of electric vehicles. And, you know, I think, you know, over 20 percent by 2027 and and. You know, these are numbers that are that are just really not realistic because our electricity grid, our grid cannot sustain it without significant oh. investments. And so um, and again, not opposed to electric vehicles. We have a lot of companies that are you know, bringing yep. forth amazing technologies and trying to build out, um, you know, uh, charging networks, which is great because for people that want to have electric vehicles, you know, we want to make sure that they have the ability to charge anywhere. Um, but forcing it upon people where you want to take away their choice, where they've got, you know, bans on the, the gasoline powered yep. engine, um, you know, up and down the, the the northeast by certain years. I mean, I think I think those policies are harmful um, uh, to to, you know, America from an from an energy standpoint and, and a policy standpoint. So I see when I say what's around the corner, it's hard to see past November because there's going to be two very different futures. For, right. for America and for the, you know, specifically for the energy industry um, and, and what that looks like. And so uh, I think once we, you know, once we get past November, then we'll have a better idea of, 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 you know, to some degree, at least what the next four years will hold. Maybe we oh. can't, maybe we can and, only look at the future in four year cycles at this point. So, you know, and that's the sad part is when you take a look at Saudi Aramco, and uh, you take a look at the other state-owned uh, uh, oil companies that are out there. Saudi Aramco yesterday said that they've, they, uh, I believe their profit for was $112 billion and it was 25% down because of uh, the price of oil. And you take a look at gasoline prices to the consumers 
are always lower under a Republican. So the oil and gas companies make less money under a Republican, but the consumers are better off. So you would sit here and go, which one is really showing, you know, that you're a true patriot when you're sitting there going, I'll vote for energy security and have all these great high paying jobs like in Texas and everything else. Or will I pay for higher prices at the pump? <laughs> That's what it's going to come down to. Yeah, it, uh, it's I've, I've had that very conversation with uh, with people throughout the industry that um, and it's it's not a perfect chart, but it's pretty close to to follow sort of the presidential policies and where prices go. And, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's an interesting situation. I had an EMP operator. Uh, God bless him. He said, I make more money under Democrats. And I'm like, uh, that one that, that kind of different. I'm over here going, wait a minute. And it's he's true. Higher oil prices follow Democrats. Correct. And what's interesting, and I, I, I heard a presentation on this one time, is that, you know, when you have low energy prices, when you when you're paying two dollars a gallon for fuel and your natural gas is a dollar fifty MCF and all of the all of the right. prices, of all the goods are down, um, that provides more economic freedom for the individual. Right. And when when individuals have more economic freedom, it allows them the time and the energy and the space to be able to really focus on their environmental concerns and what's going on, more the altruistic issues as opposed to putting food on the table. Right now, we're in a situation where people are only really worried about putting food on the table um, because inflation is so high. And so they're not thinking about those things. But then, you know, if we if we get policies in place that drive the cost down, then everyone's focus changes from putting food onto the table of how can we make the world a better place. Um, and so wow. that's, that is, that is part of the cycle. And I think what, how, how that happens again, that's, that's, these are my personal views on, on, on that particular, right. but, but, but it was a, it was a really interesting presentation presentation that got me thinking about, you know, how that actually happens and the impact it has, you know, on, on the United States, you know, somewhat cyclical political system. Wow. Uh, you know what, Gifford, this has been an absolute wonderful talk, but I want to have a uh, open invitation to you anytime that you have a announcement or anything that you feel of uh, very uh, importance, please, uh, we'll cut an immediate uh, episode for you and, uh, get the word out for you. And uh, I appreciate it. And that goes, that goes both ways. So, uh, you know, if there's something that pops up and you're just looking to get, you know, someone's perspective on, or, you know, if you decide that you want to do a deep dive on, um, hydrogen policy, then, you know, maybe I'm not the right person, but there is somebody at API that will always be the right person. And so that We've got experts that cover everything. So, you know, if you need to do a deep dive into a, a policy segment or if you just want some high level conversation like this, I'm happy to join anytime. Oh, that's fabulous. And how do people get a hold of you, Gifford? Sure. Well, uh, the easiest way to get a hold of me is by email. That's briggsg at api.org. But, you know, you can just go to the API website and learn more about our amazing organization, which is pretty easy, api.org. Um, and right now, I think if you're watching on TV right now, you can see our, our campaign that's going on right now where we're talking about lights on energy. Uh, and we've got a website for that as well where you can we're just talking about how we keep the lights on. Isn't that great? Well, thank you for stopping by the podcast today, man. I appreciate you. Happy to do it. You have a great rest of your day. Thanks.